Every year, beginning in April, these fields behind us just completely explode with dandelion blooms. And it's true to a lot of people, ah! dandelions represent a pest. But for us, they're a welcomed and even anticipated friend. And out of all the ways we like to use dandelion as a wild food, nothing is probably more favored than that of dandelion wine. So if you're one of those people who may look at dandelion as this pesky plant, but may be willing to turn a leaf, then please stick around and see how we turned this common garden weed into a tasty brew. My name's Hank, I'm here with the Junosaurus, and you're watching Juniper. You want to pick some dandelion flowers? gonna go back to the house. Mama's gonna take you back. You say bye bye. Yeah. You say bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you for helping. There's many ways to make homebrew and exponentially so the amount of tutorials for doing such. Instead of covering the ins and outs of winemaking, I'm going to share how to make this particular recipe. For this batch, I'll be producing approximately one gallon of wine. And I'm going all naturel. You heard me right. I'm using the 100% naturally occurring wild yeast on the flowers. After all, we want this to be as wild as possible. For dandelion wine, the part we are interested in is just the flower petals. The essence we hope to extract is completely on the flower and any of the green is discarded. It's a bit of a trick removing the petals from the flower head, but with some practice there's a twisting technique that can be used that will slowly pop them out. It takes some practice and by the time you go through a whole bowl of these you're going to be a pro. The ideal flowers to harvest are the fresh blooms. And the best time to pick is mid to late morning when the pollen is being released. If your picking time is right, your fingers will become totally covered with pollen. I find it important to note that because I hope to cultivate the naturally occurring yeast on the flowers, they will have to be used fresh in the batch and not steeped in boiling water, kind of like what you would see in most dandelion wine recipes. And the reason is steeping will kill off the wild yeast, which is fine if you're going to introduce a packet of commercial yeast. On the flip side, by not steeping the flowers, I'll have to be extra picky about the quality of the flowers I choose 
because I don't want to introduce any extra competing bacteria or molds. For that reason, I'm carefully avoiding any flowers which are aged or have been nibbled on by slugs. A careful examination can reveal chew marks or slugs slimy residue. Native pollinators, on the other hand, are a welcomed sight. These little guys do wonders in spreading around wild yeast as they go from flower to flower, and this helps ensure that our batch has introduced a heavy dose of wild yeast from the get-go. By avoiding the slug-damaged flowers, these pollinators still have plenty of food to forage for themselves. So in review, slugs, bad. Pollinators, good. So I want to show you guys something really exciting because I came down here to the creek to pick myself some more dandelion flowers and I can't believe it because it's the first time I've seen them here, but I stumbled upon some half-free morels. So like a, a true morel, the caps are similar in their texture, but unlike a true morel, instead of the cap attaching to the stem at the base, it attaches halfway up. Now verpas look similar. The difference is a verpa attaches all the way at the top, and the verpa usually has like a cotton type fiber on the inside of the stem where this is hollow. But what a cool find. I'm gonna need this camera to take some pictures, so I'm gonna put you guys on the cell phone real quick. After a night of soaking in salt water to remove all the bugs and debris, I rinsed it off, patted them dry, and then gave them a good fry. I like to use olive oil and garlic and really not much else to bring out the flavor in these delicious gourmet mushrooms. Smelling good, huh? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah.
<laughs> it's still too soon to give juniper a taste, but she appreciated the smell. If you're wondering what they taste like, they're very similar to your common morel. Maybe slightly less meaty, earthy in flavor, but still very good. Another consideration when making natural wine is the limitations of wild yeast. Most naturally occurring yeast have an alcohol tolerance between 5 to 7%. With that in mind, it's important that our original specific gravity, aka the amount of fermentable sugars used in this batch, doesn't exceed a potential alcohol of 7%. Otherwise, we could end up with a very sweet wine. So. Taking all that into consideration, I broke down my recipe like this. One quart of packed dandelion flowers, four and a half quarts water, 20 ounces sugar, juice of two lemons, one teaspoon yeast nutrient, one tablespoon molasses. This results with an original gravity of 1.050 or a potential alcohol of 6.1%. And that's assuming the yeast eats everything dry. To create the wine must, I first pour a quart of water into a pot and after measuring, mix in the sugar, add the molasses and mix. Once it comes to a boil, the heat is turned off and it's allowed to cool. The remaining water is added to a sterilized brewing vessel. In this case, a two and a half gallon bucket. Then I add the lemon juice and one quarter teaspoon of the yeast nutrient. Now this is important because after a visible fermentation takes place, which could be a few days, I'll add the remaining yeast nutrient one quarter teaspoon a day for three days, totaling the complete one teaspoon. Once the boiled sugar water has had time to cool, it's added into the batch. And after making sure the temperature is now in a safe range, under 100 degrees, the dandelion flowers are added in next, being placed in a food grade mesh sack. This will help strain them out later once we remove them. Once again, everything is given a good mix. Now at this point, the lid is snapped on and a towel with the weight is placed on the lid which has a hole in it. This will allow the mixer to breathe as that yeast develops. In the meantime, the bucket is kept on the kitchen counter where over the course of the next few days, it gets a good mix a few times a day. So it's been four days now and there's a definite sign of active fermentation, which is great news. And a few more days later, especially after the nutrient regimen, fermentation really took off. Now let's fast forward to over two weeks and fermentation has significantly slowed down. At this point, it's safe to remove the dandelion and I'm gonna squeeze out as much as this fermenting wine as possible. And the whole thing is transferred into a glass jug and this is where it will be allowed to finish fermentation before being bottled. For now, we'll have to let this batch age, but be sure to stay tuned for a future tasting. Also, be sure to keep your eye out for more videos on how to use this amazing plant, such things as making bread, honey, and even paper. Thank you very much for watching till the end. Please share your winemaking experience in the comments below. I'd love to hear them. Hit like, subscribe if you haven't already, and please consider supporting this channel by sharing this video or one of the many avenues down in the description. A special thank you to my current supporters and as always, happy foraging.